Welcome back. For those of you who have heard me before, this is the third iteration of the start. But uh, this is Jim Potts with Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity in Springfield. Today is the uh, webinar on wheel eligibility for adults and youth. This is the second in a trilogy, a three-peat of wheel eligibility um, webinars that are scheduled. The first was conducted last Thursday, the 10th of September, and it covered WIO and general eligibility, which is relevant for authorization to work in the United States, compliance with selective service, along with we discussed the locally approved waiver, went through the details about that, and then veterans priority of service. And after we completed uh, WIO uh, general eligibility, we then covered the block on WIO, a low income, a low income is an important block for both adults because if a client meets uh, WIO low income criteria as an adult, it's a priority, as well as it's important for youth. 95% of in-school youth are required to meet low income guidelines, and then depending on the barriers, an out-of-school youth has he or she might need to meet low income guidelines. So, so that presentation on uh, Thursday, if you didn't get a chance to participate, I highly encourage you to view the recording that was completed. Um, and then uh, it'll be maybe tie more of this together if you have some questions, more details about general eligibility and low income, because we won't be covering those in detail again today. So uh, what we're going to do is cover adult eligibility first, then we'll open it up for questions related to adult eligibility, and then we'll move on to the youth eligibility and, and conclude with any questions related to youth. Um, also, if you have any questions from last week, uh, from the Thursday presentation on general eligibility or low income, you can bring those up also. For the adult title, um, there's several different commerce policies as well as federal guidance on it. It all starts with the Win Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act that came out in 2014. It became effective July 1st of 2015. The most current guidance for the adult title from Department of Labor is under Training and Employment's Guidance Letter 1916, Guidance on Services Provided Through Adult and Dislocated Worker under WIOA, and it's from March of 2017, so that is the most current guidance uh, for eligibility from DOL. For eligibility policies here with commerce that's relevant, you have the general, general eligibility. And within the general eligibility, there's an attachment A, which deals with the different documentation source documents that could be used to support different eligibility. And that attachment A uh, in the general eligibility is also an attachment A to the adult eligibility, to the low income eligibility, to the youth eligibility, to the dislocated worker. So it's the attachment A to all of the different eligibility policies. And again, that's the documentation choices uh, acceptable documentation choices to support different eligibility criteria. Also relevant for the adult is the selective service guidance, then that the aforementioned adult eligibility policy, the low income, and then a really important policy related to the adult title is that service priorities policy, and we'll cover that in detail today. And then another really important is the basic skills deficiency commerce notice that was put out. And just recently, September 3rd, uh, commerce released a, chap uh, a change two, uh, to that wheel and notice 1901. And again, that's about basic skills deficiency. Uh, okay. So, I got, oh, there we go. Okay. So now I got muted. Now I unmuted, I believe. So, um, so I think I got muted about the time we were finishing off speaking about the change to to the basic skills deficiency policy, uh, and that came out on September 3rd, uh, the most recent edition of it. And we'll cover some details. It's very relevant for the adult title and the youth later on uh, for that we owe a notice 1901. So for general eligibility as well as low income, as I'd mentioned earlier, uh, we did that presentation on Thursday the 10th, and I'd sent you out a link to that if you didn't get a chance to participate. Um, as I mentioned, under adult eligibility, the uh, adults are required to be 18 years or older. 
You have to be a citizen or non, on, a non-citizen who's authorized to work in the United States. And if you're a guy who's born on or after January 1st, 1960, you have to be compliant with Selective Service. If you're not compliant with Selective Service, then you'd have to have a locally approved waiver in order to move forward. And those are some of the things we covered on that Thursday, September 10th presentation. One of the things about WIA, or excuse me, WIA as compared to WIA, under WIA for the adult title, there was a sequence of service that had to be followed. A client had to have a, a career, or excuse me, a core service under WIA before he or she could move into intensive services, and then they had to have intensive services before they could move into training services, and it was required under the WIA legislation. Well, WIOA does not require uh, services in order to go into training. However, slash comma, the career services, part of those include the development of an IEP, which is a career service. So in a sense, uh, a, an adult does have to have that IEP, which is a career level service. Now the exception could be if you're coordinating with outside agencies, maybe your wheel of partners, and maybe they've completed an IEP, an individual employment plan on the clients, but most uh, WIO or grantees, LWIAs that I'm familiar with, even if they received an IEP for maybe a core partner, they would still want to, to put their own uh, two cents and their own information from the assessment. So that's just a little bit of background on that. Um, the WIO adult priorities, that's one of the biggest things to understand about the adult title. And I get a lot of questions about this because we're used to giving a priority for clients under the adult funding stream that were low income, qualified under any of the low income criteria. What a lot of folks don't understand is that you also get equal priority for your adult clients if he or she is basic skills deficient. So um, you don't have to be both low income and basic skills deficient. That basic skills deficient is an equal priority under the adult funding stream for eligibility. Now there are three different ways somebody could be determined basic skills deficient. We're going to cover all of those today also. And those include um, the test by taking an assessment test. There's also a new basic skill screening tool that can assist with determining basic skills deficiency on a client. And then if somebody is assessed as being an English language learner, they're also considered basic skills deficiency for the priority. So again, we're going to uh, touch on all of those to deal with basic skills deficiency in pretty good detail here in a moment. Uh, as was addressed also in the, in the WIO general eligibility presentation, uh, based on guidance from the Jobs for Veterans Act, a veteran or qualified spouse of the veteran must receive priority of service over other qualified individuals who are not a veteran or qualified spouse. But again, if a person is not a veteran or qualified spouse, but they meet one of the priorities uh, of being low income or basic skills deficient, they might receive the, they would receive a higher priority than a veteran who did not meet those priorities. And, and we'll cover that because that's really laid out well in our services policy. And here's an example, or here's a, showing what the services policy addresses. The highest possible priority of an adult client under WIOA is a veteran or an eligible spouse of a veteran who's either low income or are basic skills deficient or an English language learner. So that's your number one client under adults. The second priority under the adult funding stream are individuals who are not veterans or qualified spouse of the veterans who are, who are either low income or are basic skills deficient or an English language learner. The third priority under the adult funding stream is a veteran or an eligible spouse of a veteran who do not meet WIOA low income criteria and are not basic skills deficient or English language learner. And then the fourth level of priorities under the adult funding stream are non-vets or not uh, qualified spouse of a veteran who are not low income or, or are not basic skills deficient or English language learner. Now DOL does give latitude for each local area 
to put a level of their own priority between three and four. You can never override one, two, and three. Those are preset priorities. But between three and four, a local area could set up other criteria because four is basically all other individuals. So maybe an example could be between three and four, a local area could put some self-sufficiency criteria based on um, the lower living income standard, maybe something like 200% or less uh, under the lower living income standard for a, veteran or for a, a non-low income, non-basic skills deficient to have a priority over those who meet no uh, eligibility under the fourth one of, of no low income or basic skills deficient. So I know that's a lot in the weeds and not local, or many local areas do not do that, but they could. Uh, it does give latitude between three and four that a local area could have a local policy, but at no time could any local policy override one, two, and three for those priorities. So it's really important to understand that. So as we discussed on uh, Thursday, September 10th, we went over there are eight different ways to be low income, and if a client meets any one of the eight ways, and I'll just do a quick recap. Those could be cash welfare, so if they're on TANF or SSI or federally or locally approved uh, uh, cash welfare programs, or if they're on food stamps, or if they're homeless, or if they're a foster child, or if uh, they've done a family income calculation, or if they're a family of one due to disability. I say there are eight, but really if you think about the two, in-school youth, free or reduced spice lunch, uh, you couldn't use that under the adult funding stream, and you couldn't use the youth living in a po high poverty area under the adult funding stream. So really there are six uh, ways that your adult could be low income. So again, if a client meets any one of those low income, uh, they would receive a priority under the adult funding stream. And the other priority is basic skills deficient. So it's important to understand this definition, and this is right out of the wheel of legislation, in respect to an individual who is a youth that the individual has an English reading, writing, or computing skills at or below the eighth grade level on a generally accepted standardized test, or B, is a youth or an adult that the individual is unable to compute or solve problems or read, write, or speak English at a level necessary to function on the job in the individual's family or in society. That new, the new basic skills screening tool that we'll speak about in a moment, it was put into place to capture those who fall under the category of B. For years in Illinois, the only way we had to determine basic skills deficiency was just the math and the English assessment tests. And if you read this definition, that's really for youth. Now we can use it also for adults, but also as another option is that basic skill screening tool that's covered, uh, that we'll cover in a moment. And where that comes into play for the strictly eligibility criteria is that subsection B of this definition. So again, as a recap, as a way a person could meet basic skills deficiency, the priority if they score at or below eighth grade level on either a math or reading assessment test, they would be determined basic skills deficient. Or if they use the new basic skills screening tool that's part of uh, WEO and NOTICE 19.01 under change two, uh, it was also part of the original policy that came out for this basic skills deficiency. And then the change one came out in July. Um, it also used this, uh, the basic skills screening tool and then it's still effective, effect, uh, this change two that came out in September. And we're going to cover more details about that basic skill screening tool in a moment. Uh, and lastly, another way an individual could be assessed as an English language, if they're assessed as an English language learner, they would be determined basic skills deficiency. So for that basic skill screening tool, again, the documentation requirement is, is in WEO notice 19903, and it's, a, it's an attachment in there. And how this screening tool is supposed to work is every client, they're supposed to be given this screening tool prior to even taking assessment tests. 
So when a client's given this, there's these six questions. And if they have a no to any one of these questions, it makes them basic skills deficient based on the screening tool. The only documentation you would need is this completed and signed uh, assessment tool by the client. So uh, the questions are set. The first one, do you have a high school diploma, general education development certificate, or a high school equivalency? Now, do keep in mind, people that are currently in high school, they would not answer no to this. So this is only for individuals who are out of school. So what it what basically tells us is that somebody is 18, they're out of school, they're no longer um, in high school, and they do not have a high school diploma or their GED, they're going to be determined basic skills deficient for eligibility purposes for a priority. The second question on the screening tool, can you follow basic written instructions and diagrams with no help or just a little help? If a client answers no to that, it's going to make them basic skills deficient due to the screening tool. The third question, can you fill out basic medical forms and job applications? If the answer is no, the client would be determined basic skills deficient based on the screening tool. Four, can you add, subtract, multiply, and divide with whole numbers up to three digits? A response of no makes the person basic skills deficient due to the screening tool. Five, can you do basic tasks on a computer? A response of no, again, would make the person basic skills deficient due to the screen tool. Or the sixth question, do you speak and read English well enough to get, a, get and keep a job? If the response is no, it, makes, it would indicate the person has basic skills deficient due to the screening tool. They only must have one no. They don't have to have multiples. If a client has any one no to this, they would meet the criteria as basic skills deficient due to the screening tool. Where this is recorded, it's on the IWDS education status screen of the application. It's a new question that was added in the spring, and it's really simple. There's a question based on the, the completed basic skills screening tool, does the client meet basic skills deficient criteria? If it's populated with a yes, the internal logic within IWDS is going to make the person basic skills deficient, which is a priority under the adult funding stream. The only acceptable documentation for this at time of certification would be the completed uh, basic skills screening tool by the client. And you as a career planner are expected to, to sign on that also. The next one we're going to talk about is the English language learner. Uh, the definition for that is when used with respect to an individual, an, an eligible individual means an eligible individual who has a limited ability in reading, writing, speaking, or comprehending the English language and whose native language is a language other than English or who lives in a family or community environment where a language other than English is the dominant language. So the response within the WIOA application it's on the uh, characteristics and barriers screen, and the question is just simply English language learner. If it's populated with a yes, then there has to be a language of preference given. If the language of preference is not one of the choices within the dropdown and the other is populated, there's a free-flowing text box for language other that can be populated in. And that's where the barrier of English language learner, which is going to correspond for eligibility for priority as basic skills deficient under the adult title. So something I want to make sure we also, I get several questions that come in reference the test, the, the assessment tests. So it's really important to understand dates if you're looking for your basic skills um, determination based on assessment tests. And the, the assessment test must be given on or prior to whatever your application date is before IWDS logic is going to pick that up. So as an example, if a client has an application date of 8-1-2020 but was not given the assessment tests on a date or who was actually given assessment tests on a date after that 8-1-20, the logic within IWDS is not going to be able to pick it up. So you'd have to adjust your, your application date to a date on or after whenever there's assessment tests for that client to get picked up as basic skills deficient. 
So again, if I'm your client and I have an application date of 8-1-2020, but you gave me my assessment tests on 8-10-2020, and then you attempted to determine eligibility on a date prior to 8-10, the internal logic is never going to pick me up as basic skills deficient, even if I scored at or below eighth grade level. So then all you'd want to do is adjust my application date to a date on or after those assessment tests. And then the eligibility logic with an IWS will, in fact, pick that up. So that's something that comes up fairly often, um, and it's just a, a little detail, but it makes sense if you think about it. If a, if a date of a test is after your application, uh, the logic is not recognizing that test. So that's the reason why it's important to adjust your, your dates if you need that assessment test to be uh, the way I'm de be the client's being determined basic skills deficient. So now in order for an adult client to move into training services, as I mentioned earlier, we have a career services and training services, and the WIOA legislation states you don't have to, as a client, have career services prior to training. But as I mentioned, you must have a, an, an individual employment plan. So our internal logic in IWDS is going to require a documented assessment and an IEP. Now again, maybe you receive you use the assessment from a core partner. Maybe this client's already in adult ed and they had an individual employment plan built and an assessment done by adult ed, and we're using all that information. So then you could potentially go into uh, straight into training services, but you would have to have a copy of that complete assessment, uh, and you'd record that on the WIO additional criteria screen when asked questions about who completed the, or do you have a complete assessment, do you have a complete IEP, who, who's it from. Um, again, I think probably 99% of our WIO service providers would always want to do their own assessment versus taking an assessment from one of our core partners, just because uh, they're uh, where they're looking to serve the clients might not be the same. Adult ed is probably not near as good at doing assessments for job opportunities that our WIOA Title I career planners are. So let's talk about that IEP. What is an IEP? It's a plan developed by the participant and the career planner to identify the participant's employment goal, appropriate achievement objectives, and the appropriate combination of services for the participant to achieve the employment goal, including providing information on eligible providers of training services and career pathways to attain their career objectives. So all IEPs, regardless of what form you use or if you, you type your uh, complete IEP in a case note or if you have a, a, locally, uh, a local document that how you record your IEP, all IEPs have one primary objective, which is an overall goal, and that's that client's full-time self-sustaining employment, and it's going to be uh, tailored specifically for an industry or occupation the client's attempting to get in. And underneath that goal, you're going to have the different objectives that are needed to reach that goal, and then underneath the objectives are the various WIOA-funded services that are needed to reach the objective and the overall goal. So that's what your whole IEP is, your goal, objectives, and the services needed to reach those. So again, the assessment IEP could be completed by either the OEA staff, which would be the career planner, or a WIOA core partner, which could be adult ed, Wagner Peisner, Voc Rehab, TANF staff, uh, a training provider, or other staff or some other agencies could conduct it. Again, as I touched on, most often the assessment IEP will be completed by our WIOA adult career planners. A co-enrollment, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, I had questions at different times asking why I present adults and youth on the same uh, block or the same date. And there's a lot of opportunity for co-enrollment with the youth and adult title. Um, a lot of times your youth might already meet low income, especially if he or she was an in-school youth, and maybe they're through high school now and they're going to go off to post-secondary, and you want to co-enroll that client and use your wheel of funds in order to uh, fund his or her training under the adult funding stream while they're still enrolled as a youth. Um, one of the things about co-enrollment is you cannot exit from one title until services are completed in all titles. 
So a lot of times people are reluctant to co-enroll, especially if they have different providers for youth and adults, because again, the, the youth cannot exit if you've co-enrolled into the adult funding stream until all services are completed. Um, if a client is co-enrolled, then they're going to fall into performance outcomes for each of the titles that the client had been registered into WIOA services in. So to recap, for an overall of WIOA adult eligibility, a client must be 18 years of age or older, be legally authorized to work in the U.S., and if, a, if born a male who, has, who was born on or after January 1, 1960, must be compliant with selective service requirements. And then it's really important under the adult funding stream to understand those priorities. A veteran's priority of service must always be followed. And then understanding those priorities that we owe a low income, which was covered on the, the September 10th PowerPoint or presentation, or if the client is basic skills deficient, and that could be either English language learner or the basic skills screening tool or math and reading assessment tests. Either one of those can make the client, or either of those three can make a client basic skills deficient. And again, to reiterate, both low income and basic skills deficient is an equal priority under the adult funding stream. This concludes the presentation on WIO adult eligibility. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me at james.potts at illinois.gov, or you can call me at 217-416-7097. So what we're going to do now is we're going to open up the lines for any questions uh, or anything you've put in the chat box, and we'll answer it now. So David, are there any things in there for the adult funding stream? So Jim, it looks like we have one so far. What are considered basic tasks on a computer? Um, it could be as broad as, as what you would want to make it, or as the client feels. Um, it's not something you could tell him or her, can you do basic tasks? It would be a question of how they feel. So there's going to probably be no strict um, criteria. But if you just think about what, are, what you would consider if you were, let's say, trying to hire somebody uh, for basic, uh, basic skills for a computer, what would your expectation? I think would probably be understanding the keyboard, um, understanding this, uh, this common terminology, turning on the computer, getting into emails, things like that. So, so it can be pretty broad. It's not, uh, it doesn't have to be really stringent. So um, a lot of those, if you, if you just think about those questions, and a lot of this is in general if your assessments, a lot of times you're having to make the call or working with the client, uh, but if a client feels that he or she uh, has difficulty with, with something like computers, then that would be a, a responsive no on that. Next question, David. At this time, that is the only question. All right, so let me find my PowerPoint on low income because I thought I had it open, but now it seems to be gone. Might want to let me show my adult or my youth PowerPoint for some reason here. There we go. Can you see it now, David? Yep. All right, we're going to move on now to the youth title. For the youth, we have federal guidance out of the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act of 2014 that became effective July 1st, 2015. 
And then for the youth title, Training Employment Guidance Letter 2116, which was the third wheel of Title One or wheel of Title One Youth Formula Guidance, and it's also dated March of 2017, and it is the most current guidance by Department of Labor in a Teagle form. They've given other guidance on the youth, but it's not uh, as the formal as this Teagle has came out. And we'll cover some of the things that I'm, I'm speaking about other guidance here in a moment. Um, for the state guidance, you have general eligibility, you have selective service, you have general youth eligibility, out of school youth eligibility, in school youth, and then the basic skills deficient policy uh, notice that just came out in September, and then the low income guidance. So prior to this youth eligibility, um, it would be important to understand the details that were covered in the Thursday, September 10th, 2020 presentation on general eligibility as well as low income. Again, general eligibility requirements are you must be authorized to work in the United States, and if you're a guy born, uh, in this case, December after December 31st, 1959, which uh, all of our youth are going to be born after that, once a guy reaches 18, he must be registered with Selective Service. And one of the other things we touched on uh, for selective service, again, if a young man comes into the WIOA program under the age of 18, when he turns 18, he must register with selective services within 30 days of, of turning 18, or else all his WIOA services must be closed out. So we covered this in depth at the presentation on September 10th, uh, 2020, uh, where we spoke about selective service, but this was something I just wanted to touch on just in case somebody wasn't, didn't see that one uh, that works with the youth. If you have any youth that came in under 18, he must register with selective service when he turns 18, uh, within 30 days of turning 18, or all services must be closed out. One of the things about the WIOA youth program that was a little bit different from the previous WIA program is in-school and out-of-school youth got separated into eligibility. So there was different, broader eligibility categories for the out-of-school youth as compared to the in-school youth. But we'll cover both today. School status. School status should be recorded based on what the client is doing at time of application, not what the client is going to go and enter. Uh, sometimes we get a little confusion on that if a client's coming in and let's say he or she had dropped out of high school and we're going to put him or her into a GED program. Well, they're out of school because they're not in at the time. You're going to put him or her into something. So we're always looking at what's going on with the client at time of application, not what you or us are going to put him or her in. Um, for the purposes of WIOA, providers of adult education under Title II, so that's adult ed of WIOA, youth build programs and job corps programs, high school equivalency programs, and dropout reengagement programs are not considered to be schools for the purposes of determining school status. The one exception is youth attending high school equivalency programs, including those considered to be dropout reengagement programs, funded by public K through 12 school systems that are classi classified by the school uh, system as still enrolled in schools or considered in school youth. Now, the one exception I want to make sure that everybody's clear on for this subparagraph down here is often there's programs that are partnered with adult education uh, that fall under the K through 12. And I'll give you a real good example here in Springfield. In Springfield, we have a program called Lawrence Adults um, that's through the high school and it's a alternative high school program, but that is a partner with adult ed. So since they're a partner with adult ed, even though it is funded by the, the K through 12 school system, um, they would still be falling under the out of school youth. So it's really important to understand if you have a, a program that's an alternative that's funded through K through 12 to find out is that maybe one of the partnerships with adult ed. And if you don't know that, let me know and I can get you the listing or the most current listing that I have of the programs that are uh, currently partners under the adult ed Title II. 
So determine school status with an IWDS, Illinois Workforce Dis Development System, it's on the education status screen. And it's simply one question, it's attending school. If that attending school is answered with a yes, the internal logic is gonna make the client an in-school youth. That's the entire criteria, the entire internal logic. Attending school as a yes makes the client in school. Attending school as a no, the, the internal logic of IWDS is going to make that client an out of school youth. And this is just demonstrating the out of school youth. So again, attending school on the education status screen is going to determine in school versus out of school. So in school youth for eligibility ages, it's uh, the wheel of guidance as well as our state policy, not younger than 14 or older than 21. Uh, most programs aren't putting in anybody that's 14 because one thing about the in-school youth, if you put a client in, he or she's going to have to graduate high school uh, before you're going to be able to get, before you're going to be able to exit him or her, and that's a long time. And a person goes through a lot of changes if they come in your program and they're 14 years old. So most grantees I'm familiar with, they're working with in-school youth at 16 or older. Um, attending school is as defined by state law. One of the really important things to understand about in-school youth is 95% of in-school youth must meet WIOA low-income criteria. And again, we covered this on the presentation on Thursday, the 10th of September, in depth. Um, so uh, if you haven't watched that presentation, it's important you do that. Lastly, in-school youth clients, besides being low income, they must have one or more of the following barriers, and it's going to be shown on the following slides. So be basic skills deficient, and that could either be based on the assessment test, scoring at or below eighth grade level, or the basic skills screening tool that I touched on in the adult presentation, or if they're assessed as an English language learner, or if you're an offender, homeless, runaway, foster child or aged out of foster care, pregnant or parenting, an individual with a disability, or last, that barrier of an individual requiring additional assistance to enter or complete an education program or to secure and hold employment. We're going to go in depth for each one of these barriers uh, and kind of demonstrate where they're at in IWDS too. So we touched on this basic skills deficiency uh, under the adult title, but it's the same definition for your youth. So respect to an individual is a youth, that is the individual has an English reading, writing, or computing skill at or below eighth grade level on generally standardized, uh, accepted standardized tests. So you're talking about the, the TABE test or the CASIS, uh, the test that's going to give you that grade level equivalency. Uh, two is, or B, is a youth or an adult that the individual is unable to compute or solve problems or read, write, or speak English at a level necessary to function on the job or in the individual, in, in the individual's family or in society. So as we touched on in that adult presentation, it could be uh, the assessment test at a low eighth grade level. It could be based on that basic skills screening tool or on the assessment, the assessed client being an English language learner. And this, we won't go over it in depth like we just did for the adults, but it's the same premise. It's the basic skills screening tool. If a client is currently in high school, then you would not answer no to the first question. Um, that was only for clients who are out of high school or high school age. Um, then the, the following questions two through, through six are relevant for your clients. And again, it's important to understand for this basic skill screening tool, it is supposed to be completed on your clients prior to him or her taking your assessment test. So I don't know how your processes work, but uh, this should be one of your forms that you're having a client complete early on. So within IWS, on the education status screen, as I showed earlier, is where that basic skills deficient question is. And again, based on the completed basic skills screening tool, does the client meet basic skills deficient criteria? If it's populated with a yes, then that, that barrier of basic skills deficient is going to get picked up for your in-school youth and your out-of-school youth uh, barriers for a youth barrier. The only documentation for that screening tool is that screening tool completed by the client and the career plan will have been signed it. Again, that question about English language learner, the term English language learner with you with 
when used with respect to an eligible individual, means an, an eligible individual who has limited ability in reading, writing, speaking, or comprehending the English language, and whose native language is a language other than English, or who lives in a family or a community environment where a language other than English is the dominant language. So again, if the client says a yes to the English language learner, on the characteristics and barriers screen, then there has to be a language of preference chose. And then under if one of those are not selected and other is checked, then there's a free-flown text box where the client could tell the other language he or she uses that the career planner could record. Just as I touched on the um, testing for the adult, it's important to understand dates the application date of your client. If you give an assessment test on a date after your application, the internal logic is not going to be able to pick that, that test up. So you'd want to adjust your uh, application date to a date on or after whatever date you gave that assessment test in order for the logic to pick it up. Some of the definitions for an offender. Uh, this definition is in both the WIOA legislation as well as in the TEGL, the youth TEGL, an adult or youth who is or has been subject to any stage of the criminal justice process for whom services under this act may be beneficial or who requires assistance in overcoming artificial barriers to employment resulting from the record of arrest or conviction. So you notice that this speaks about even an individual being arrested, not even convicted. So uh, maybe somebody has uh, been arrested, they weren't convicted, but maybe in that neighborhood they're known for uh, being in trouble. So they could still be considered an offender even if there was not a conviction where the offender is captured for the in-school youth is on the characteristics of barrier screen, there are two questions, offender felon, offender misdemeanor. If either one of those are marked with a yes, the in-school youth barrier of offender is going to be picked up. Next, we're going to cover for the youth barrier is homeless. Uh, the definition for homeless, there are two different ones. You have the Violence Against Women's Act of 1994 and the McKinty-Vento Homeless Assistance Act. As I touched on when I did the presentation on low income last Thursday, the 10th of September, I think that the Violence Against Women Act is very, it's much broader than the McKinney-Vento Homeless Assistance Act. So I encourage you to look up that Violence Against Women's Act, and it doesn't matter if it's a guy or a girl, if they meet the criteria and the definition, they can utilize it. Um, I passed on in that presentation on last Thursday that for a period of time I met the criteria for homeless under the Violence Against Women Act, I lived in my motor home on a campgrounds for a six month period when I moved back to Illinois. And according to the definition, I was considered homeless because I lived in my motor home. So, um, so it's important to understand these definitions. If the client meets the criteria, it, it, they meet the criteria. So one of the things about homeless, it's also a barrier uh, or it's, besides just being a barrier for in-school youth, it's also an automatic low-income qualification factor. So any client who is, is homeless, it makes him or her eligible because they are low-income and they have the barrier. And one of the things about homeless, uh, and I passed this on last week in our presentation, each quarter we're required to upload our database and we send it to Department of Labor. And every quarter we get the same feedback that in Illinois we do not serve enough homeless routine feedback. I don't think they ever change it. If they had a typo in their feedback, it would come the same, same thing every quarter. Um, on this, there's a couple things. It's difficult, and you guys know well more than I, to serve a person who's, tr who's really homeless because he or she's hard to get in contact with, they're moving and things like that. But if you find that one of your clients meets one of the definitions that's either under the Violence Against Women Act or the McKinney-Vento Homeless Act, and you're putting them in anyway, uh, mark them as homeless because you're already going to be dealing with their barrier. You're just not getting credit for it. So again, I encourage you to get those definitions and, and if your client meets the criteria, then you can record it. A lot of times my question I get is, well, what type of documentation? Well, if you look in that attachment A, which is the, about the documentation choices, it, it's pretty broad. You can use as easy as a self-attestation for homeless. You can also get uh, 
the statement from a person providing temporary residence, a statement from a shelter, um, but most often you find folks use self-attestation. So that's my commercial to make sure everybody, especially gets looks into that Violence Against Women's Act of 1994. It was included in the WIOA legislation, and again, I find it to be much broader than the McKinty Vento. Um, where the barrier for homeless is captured or identified in the application is on the characteristics and barriers screen. So um, all clients complete it regardless of the title, but it is on the, the characteristics and barriers screen. The next one we'll cover is foster child. A foster child is identified also on the characteristics and barrier screen. If it's answered with a yes, the client's going to be an automatic uh, in school youth because it's also an automatic low income qualification factor being a foster child is. So again, they have the barrier, it's both a barrier for eligibility as well as low income for a in school youth. Now, aged out of foster care, it is a barrier, and it's identified on the characteristics and barriers screen of an application, but an important thing to understand, it, it is not an automatic low-income qualification factor. So if your client's an in-school youth and they have the barrier of aged out of foster care, it works for a barrier, but they would still need to meet low-income criteria in one of the, the eight different ways that low-income is determined. Next is a runaway. Uh, it's on the youth barrier screen. To be a runaway, you have to be under the age of 18. So if you're over the age of 18, by that time you're considered an adult, so you wouldn't be a runaway. Runaway is kind of a tricky thing because it requires us to get a parental or guardian consent, anybody that's under 18, before the client can receive wheel of services. So if you think about it, somebody's a runaway and they come to us to get wheel services, and we're also mandatory reporting officials, so if we have a youth out there with no uh, guidance, we have uh, legal obligations to notify authorities on it. So it puts us in a, a difficult situation, but safety of the youth is really important. But uh, for, for signatures, again, you're going to have to have a, a parent or a guardian's consent, even if their barrier is a, a runaway. Now, there is some latitude for other people who can sign when the parents or guardians are not available that I can share with you if you come across that situation. Next one we'll talk about is pregnant or parenting. That's captured on the youth barrier screen. Um, one of the keys to make sure everybody understands is if you're a guy and you have a young lady pregnant, you cannot use the barrier of pregnant um, once the child's born. The, the male could be a parent, but he could not use pregnant as a barrier. And a, a new one for under WIOA that wasn't there for WIA was a disability. Having a disability, it makes sense to be a youth barrier, and I don't know why it wasn't under, under the WIA title for youth, but it is under WIOA for both in school or out of school. Where that's captured is on the private information screen. Um, if a client states they have a, yes, they have a disability, or if they have any other questions besides or responses other than no or prefer not to answer. So if they say yes, or disability affecting employment, or a development disability, or a learning dis disability, if any of those get uh, recorded, the logic within IWDS is going to pick that barrier up for youth in school and out of school eligibility. The last barrier we're going to touch on, and this is a really important barrier that, understand, that everybody understands where this criteria comes, for, comes from, and that's that barrier of youth requiring additional assistance to enter or complete an education program or to secure or hold employment. Each local area, local workforce innovation areas, determines their own criteria for this barrier. It's not determined by the state. The state allows each local area to set their own criteria. So when a career planner records yes to that barrier, they must understand their local policy and how the client meets that criteria within the local policy. And that's exactly what a monitor will do. If this, uh, the barrier is identified uh, as requiring additional assistance, 
which is on the youth barrier screen, uh, the local, when a monitor comes out or a DOO monitor, they're going to ask to see the local policy, and then they're going to want to see within case notes or within the client's record how he or she meets whatever the criteria within the local policy that was established, how this client meets it. So, again, it's really important to understand your local policy for that youth requiring additional assistance barrier. And again, that's captured on the youth barrier screen, and the question is simply youth need assistance. Uh, the question, if a person is not familiar and understanding eligibility, I can see it just being answered is, yeah, this youth needs assistance, he or she is sitting here in front of me. But again, it's really important to understand your local policy because each local area establishes their own criteria for the youth need assistance barrier. So this concludes the portion of in-school youth. So again, an in-school youth must meet WEO, or 95% must meet WEO low-income criteria and have at least one or more of those youth barriers that we just covered. So the next portion we're gonna speak, at, speak about is the out-of-school youth eligibility. The ages adjust here because you have youth not younger than 16 or older than 24. So I don't know how much you remember, we spoke about that adult, about co-enrollment. So often, and this would be both for in-school and out-of-school youth, but even more so for out-of-school youth, you're going to find clients that are going to be eligible for both the adult as well as the youth title, especially since they can go up to age 24 for out-of-school youth. So for the policy of not attending school, it's as defined by state law. Um, Individuals who are attending adult ed provided under Title II of WIOA, Youth Builder Job Corps, are considered out-of-school youth even if they are attending a program. Um, other than that, if a person's in high school, if they're in any sort of vocational school, if they're in any, any sort of a college or trade school, they're going to be considered in school as long as they're taking credit earning classes. Now, let's say I graduated high school out here and I'd taken placement tests out at the uh, local community college, and I had to take remedial English and remedial math that weren't credit-based just because I wasn't able to do the level of work for freshman-level math and reading. Well, then that wouldn't be considered in-school youth if those were the only courses I was taking those remedial. But at that, at that same time, if I'd taken just one history class or taken any other class that was credit bearing, then I would be considered in school. So it's really important to understand if your client's in any post secondary where it's credit earning, he or she is going to be considered an out of school youth for eligibility. So some of the guidance that was put out in, U in Teagle 2116 is if a youth graduates high school and registers for post-secondary education, um, they're considered to be in-school youth. So uh, in that same example, I graduated high school, I signed up for college, and they were credit-earning classes, I would be considered in-school. But sometimes people uh, plan to go to college, and then they end up not following through. So this slide talks, or, or Teagle 2116 speaks about, was somebody who signed up, but they did not ultimately follow through with attending post-secondary education, then the youth would be considered out-of-school youth. So again, if they signed up but they didn't go to school, they'd be considered out-of-school. If they did sign up and they, and they haven't went yet, then they'd be considered in-school youth. Uh, again, as I mentioned, it's got to be credit-bearing. If a youth's in non-credit-bearing, then they can be considered out of school. Now, for the out-of-school youth, here are the following barriers that do not require an out-of-school youth to meet low-income guidelines. So if I'm a dropout, if I've dropped out of high school, and it's only high school, it's not college, I'm not, uh, I would not need to meet low-income guidelines. Just being a high school dropout, as long as I meet uh, the general eligibility of authorized to work in the United States and compliance with selective service, I am eligible as an out-of-school youth. The second barrier for an out-of-school youth that do not require the clients to meet low income is somebody within the age of compulsory attendance but has not attended school for at least the most recent complete school year quarter. What this is talking about is a person is old enough to drop out of high school, but he or she hasn't uh, attended school in the most recent school quarter, and the school won't call them a dropout. 
what happens in some school districts is they determine dropouts only at the end of maybe a school year because they report a number at the beginning of the school year of, of number of students. And they have uh, federal and state funding that's based on the number that they report. So some are reluctant to call a client or call an individual a dropout until at the end of a school year. So if you run across a situation like that where you have a young man or a young woman who stopped attending school but the school is not considering him a dropout uh, due to those restrictions, due to uh, just them not wanting to title the client a dropout, that's when this barrier would come into play. Um, the documentation for it still needs to come from a school statement that the client hasn't been attending. So um, the next bar barrier we're going to talk about, and it's subject to juvenile or adult justice system. If you remember back for the in-school use, the barrier was a fender. Well, for out-of-school use, they've changed it to subject to juvenile or adult justice system. Um, the Teagle came out the uh, 2116 and came out and basically said that it's the same barrier. So the same definition for offender is the same definition for subject to juvenile adult justice system. And we'll cover that more in depth in a moment. Homeless, we touched on that. Uh, if a person's homeless, even though it says they're not required to meet low income, it's, it's also a low income factor for federal reporting. Runaway, if a client is a runaway, then they would be considered, uh, if they're out of school youth, they would not meet, need to meet low income guidelines. One of the things about a runaway, uh, they're going to have to be under the age of 18, so if they're considered an out of school youth, more than likely they're going to have multiple barriers because they're probably going to be a dropout or else the second barrier uh, within the age of compulsory attendance was not attended for the most recent school uh, quarter because, just because they're aged, if they're under 18. The sixth barrier is if a client's either a foster child or aged out of foster child, seventh, pregnant or parenting, and then eighth, if a person has a disability. So again, for out of school youth, none of these clients are required to meet low income guidelines. I'll do a little commercial. I touched on this when I did the uh, low income policy or low income briefing on the 10th. Just because your client's not required to be low income if they have one of these barriers. If your client meets the criteria and you have documentation, I still encourage you to record it. Uh, the reason why is for your regression analysis purposes, when your local area is negotiating performance outcomes, uh, even though a client's not required to meet low income, but if you've recorded that he or she does meet it, that's another barrier for federal reporting. So as an example, Let's say we're going for negotiations and you have two LWIAs and one LWIA has 80% of their out of school youth who meet low income guidelines and have barriers as opposed to another local area where 40% of their youth met out of school youth uh, met low income criteria. When in that snapshot, who's serving the tougher to serve clients? The one where 80% of their out of school youth clients met low income and had the barriers. So again, just because they're not required to meet low income if they have one of these uh, barriers identified on the screen that's up, but if they do meet that, I would still encourage you to record it and take credit for it for federal reporting as well as uh, for your, uh, to get a full rounded picture of your client. So high school dropout. This barrier can only be used for an individual who drops out of high school and has not gone back to school. If they dropped out, and, and went back and obtained their GED, they are not considered a dropout for WIA eligibility. With an IWDS, the dropout is, is captured on the education status screen. So towards the bottom of the education status screen, it's a yes, no question. If high school dropouts populate with a yes, the client's gonna be picked up as having the barrier of a dropout. There's also some internal logic in there if you try to answer highest grade complete of a high school diploma with a dropout, it's not gonna let you. So some different things along those lines. In some instances, the high school might not consider the individual a dropout until the end of a school year, and that's what we spoke about, that barrier of within the age of compulsory attendance does not attend school for the most recent uh, complete school quarter. And that's why they added that barrier. 
Um, and where that captured, that's also captured on the youth barrier screen with an age of compulsory attendance, but is not attending school. And again, this is only relevant for high school. That's subject to the juvenile adult justice system that I spoke about. Again, it's the same definition as offender, but for out of school youth, they titled it a different barrier. But Teagle 2116 that came out in March, they clarified that subject the juvenile adult justice system has the same definition as the in-school youth barrier of offender, which is an adult or youth is subject to juvenile adult justice system if who is or has been subject to any stage of the criminal justice process for whom services under this act may be beneficial or who requires assistance in overcoming artificial barriers to employment resulting from a uh, record of arrest or conviction. Uh, where this is captured is on the youth barrier screen and the question is subject to the juvenile adult justice system. And again, it's important to understand the difference of in-school, out-of-school. This is where you have to populate the, the offender barrier for your out-of-school youth. If you check the uh, offender misdemeanor, offender uh, felon, and you don't check this, it's not going to get picked up as the barrier for your out-of-school youth. So it's really important to understand these little details. So now, uh, as a recap, for an out-of-school youth who do not meet low-income criteria, uh, homeless, runaway, foster care, aged out, pregnant or pairing, individual with a disability, if any of those, um, they're, they're not required to be low-income. But if you remember our talk, homeless is an automatic low-income and foster child is. Also, for an individual, if they have a disability, uh, you really want to look in to see just for your own um, purposes, remember that family of one due to a disability where you can determine low income based on the client's own income and if he or she's below the income guidelines. So, so again, even though you're not required, uh, chances are most of your individuals who have a disability, they would probably meet criteria of low income for family of one due to disability if you want to, to make sure you get credit for that barrier for federal reporting as well as your uh, out of school youth uh, negotiations for performance. So if an out-of-school youth client did not meet any of those previous barriers, there are two more possible barriers that could support out-of-school youth eligibility, but both require the client to meet WIOA low-income criteria. So again, if they've met any of the other barriers that do not require low income, these, these wouldn't come into play. These are only going to come into play for clients who uh, did not meet any of those barriers that required uh, or didn't require low income. So these barriers are somebody that has their high school diploma or a GED, and if they're low income, if they're basic skills deficient, and that could either be based on the assessment tests or on the basic skills screening tool, or if they're assessed as an English language learner. Or the second way a person um, could meet out of school youth that must require low income is if you're using that barrier of requiring additional assistance to enter or complete an education program or secure or hold employment. And again, you have to understand your local policy if you're checking yes to this barrier. My recommendation is to leave this barrier alone unless you need it for your out of school use because uh, if not, you're probably going to have the potential of causing yourself some issues if you don't have this documentation right when the client may have already met the criteria uh, with one of the other programs. So again, these two barriers for out of school youth are the ones that require the client to meet low income, but they'd only be needed if a client did not uh, meet one of those other out-of-school youth requirements that did not require low income. So high school diploma or GED, BSD, or e English language learner. For this barrier, the client will need to have had have been an out-of-school youth that has already graduated high school or completed their GED, but is either basic skills deficient due to any one of the various ways that were addressed on slides 15 through 23 of the PowerPoints. That youth requiring assistance for this barrier of youth requiring assistance to enter, complete an education program or secure home employment, those were addressed on slides 33 and 34. Again, the biggest thing here is understanding your local policy as, if you're identifying. Last, what we're going to talk about is the 5% youth. The 5% youth is set up for uh, a, a local area to serve clients 
who would traditionally be required to meet low income guidelines, but they do not, but they still have barriers. So each local area has the latitude for up to 5%. Now the majority of the 5% clients are gonna be your in-school youth. If you just think about the sheer numbers, 95% of your in-school youth are required to meet low income guidelines, you have that 5% waiver. But also, if you consider that a certain percentage of your out-of-school youth is going to have to meet low-income guidelines, those who have the youth need assistance barrier or those that are high school graduates with a GED who's either basic skills deficient or English language learner. So to get a, a total 5%, uh, local area adds in all their in-school youth and then whatever number of out-of-school youth that were required to meet low income, they put that number together and that's where you can pull out 5% of the, of the total. Um, so again, each local area has to track this themselves. A career planner can't say, hey, yeah, I want to do a 5%er uh, without notifying their uh, folks that's in charge of the youth program at the local area because it has to be tracked at each local area. So wrapping this up, in conclusion, for all WIO youth, they must, be, uh, they must meet the WIO general eligibility, which are tied to being authorized to work in the United States. Uh, if a guy turned age 18, he has to be compliant with selective service. 95% of in-school youth must meet WIO low income criteria and have at least one or more of the identified youth barriers. And then for out-of-school youth, the majority of clients are not required to meet low income criteria unless their only barriers are tied to being a high school graduate who is basic skills deficient or an English language learner, or if it's a, a youth needing assistance barrier is their only barrier that out of school youth is going to be required to be low income. So this concludes the block on youth eligibility. If you have any questions, contact me at james.potts at illinois.gov or con call me, you can phone me on my cell at 217-416-7097. So we're going to go ahead and open the block up for any questions that you might have related to youth as well as adults, or if you have anything related to last week's for general eligibility or low income, it's a good time also to address those. Anything on there, David? Yeah, I've got a bunch of questions in the chat here. Um, so how many times does someone need to be arrested to be considered an offender? You look at the same definition I'd seen. It, there's no quanti uh, quantification of times arrested. So you have the definition and you can be as liberal as you want with that because that's the definition. It's, there's nothing that's going to say um, you have to be this many or that many. You can even be taken if you think about it. Let's say a, a young guy or gal has a problem with a lead foot and they're getting lots of speeding tickets. You know, they've had moving violations. If you think about it, that has an ability to affect their employment, affect ability to school. So it doesn't always have to be something big major. It could be traffic tickets. Uh, an example I like to use during training is let's say a, a, a guy or a gal gets arrested for, for drugs and they never get convicted, but in the neighborhood they're known as a drug dealer or a drug user or something. Well, that can be a, an offender barrier. So again, that definition is the guidance that's in the legislation. Um, it doesn't go any further than that definition. So it gives a lot of latitude to it. So, so there is no mandatory numbers. Next question, David. Uh, does the basic skills screening tool need to be done even if the participant takes the TABE test? Yep, as I mentioned, the basic skills screen tool is supposed to be done prior to the TABE. It should be one of the first things you're done, doing. So yes, it should always be done, expected to be in the file. The exceptions are, if you look at in that basic skills screening policy, there's certain people that aren't required to take tests. So let's say, um, I think some of the examples were placement tests, college degrees. If you have an associate's degree or higher, you've taken a college placement test that's scoring at or below, uh, that says you can go into college level math reading. Uh, according to the policy folks, those folks do not have to use the screen tool. But other than those, the ones who have tests waived for some reason, the screening tool is supposed to be completed prior to the assessment tests. Next question. If I use runaway as a barrier, how is that documented? It'd be probably your self-attestation of the client. That's about the only way you could. Um, 
uh, the, the, probably the bigger issues, because it's easy to identify the barrier and just have the client attest to it, it's going to be dealing with the parental and guardian consent. Because, again, uh, if he or she's under 18, you have to get guard, parent or guardian consent. So the client could attest that he or she's a runaway, um, but then you're still going to have to deal with getting the parental consent or guardian consent. So, But it would be a self-attestation to answer the question. Next, we have our homeschooled youth considered out of school. No, if you're if a client is in a homeschooling program, if this is official homeschooling program, they're considered in school youth. So it's a really good question. Um, and but if you're in school, it's uh, if you're in a homeschooling program, you're considered an in school youth. Does youth requiring assistance have to be low income? O S Y. Yes. If it's your only barrier for your out-of-school youth, youth requiring assistance requires the client to meet low-income guidelines. So, but here's the key. If they have any other youth barriers that do not require to be low-income, when it comes time for documentation, it's not even going to show up for the uh, youth needing assistance barrier. Because the way logic set up for IWDS, it first looks at those barriers that do not requ require low income. So it can get you kind of messed up a little bit because you t if for an out-of-school youth, if you've used any of the other barriers because it's not showing up at eligibility, but then when it comes time to monitor it, they're going to expect your documentation to be in there. So again, I would leave that youth being assistance alone on my out-of-school youth unless it was the barrier I needed to support eligibility, and then it would be needed for, for the client to be low-income criteria. Regarding the eight barriers that are basically automatic eligibility qualifiers for OSY, yep. low income is not required. However, it is still beneficial that we capture that LI criteria, correct? Yeah, that's where, that's where I highly encourage you to, and it's for your, your performance negotiation uh, uh, gives you more per se bullets in your gun, you know, if, if, if you have uh, going up and your, your management's negotiating performance out of, for out of school youth and they say, hey, uh, on average, 80% of our out of school youth meet low income guidelines because we were recording those barriers even though they didn't, weren't required compared to maybe a low, another area that haven't been recording those uh, low income when somebody really did meet it. Um, it makes the OEA that's taking fully credit for the client's barriers by recording it. So, so I really encourage you, but here's the key is making sure you have the documentation. Uh, Cause we run into also a lot of times where people might say yes to food stamps, uh, yes to TANF, and then not have the documentation to support it because they didn't need it. So it's a double-edged sword. You only want to record it if the client meets the criteria and you have the documentation, even though it's not needed to support eligibility just because, because you're getting a full, uh, understanding of the client's true barriers. But again, only record it if you do have the documentation. And, it, and for most of those, like you said, it's not required. So, next can, question. Can we use an applicant statement for SNAP? No, you cannot use an applicant statement for SNAP. Um, SNAP's a little difficult. SNAP is for the food stamps. Um, because in the past, we used to be able to, to go in through our, our RACF, use our RACF ID, and we could go into the IDHS case system and look up an a individual or a family that was on, or a household that was on food stamps. And now uh, we can't because it's just the way the IDHS system works, unless there's something going to change, but I don't think it has. So now we're required to have the clients bring in documentation typically that prove that they're on receiving SNAP. So, nope, you can't self-attest to it. You'd have to have uh, the formal documentation for it. So, similar question. Can we still use applicant statement for proof of school status or dropout? Yes. Yes. Um, school status, that's probably the most known uh, ways is based on applicant statements. And it's really, if you think about it, especially um, 
out of school youth, there's no other documentation than the applicant statement because how can a person prove that they're not doing something? How can you prove you're not going to to post secondary? So a lot of times we'd say a person was using a high school diploma to prove out of school youth. Well, that doesn't prove they're not in post secondary. So that's the reason why you'd have the out of school youth. Uh, or that's the reason why you'd use the, the applicant statement or the client's attestation of school status. The next question we have here, um, someone asking for clarification on slide 49, which is the, uh, the following out of school youth barriers require the individual to meet WIOA income. Yeah, criteria. Yep. Clarification on this is if this is your only barriers for out of school youth, meaning that the client didn't meet any of, of the barriers up here, last slide. If the client didn't meet any of these barriers and their only barriers that's on slide 47 and they only met one of these barriers, and that would be a high school diploma or GED who is basic skills deficient, they must be low income. Or if you're out of school youth, the only barrier is youth needing assistance, which is based on the local policy, they're required to be uh, low income. So again, if they would have met any of the other barriers, they are not required to be low income for out of school youth. If these, one of these are the only barriers, then they must meet low income guidelines before these get, uh, would, would work for eligibility. Okay, next we have can an OSY who has been appointed guardianship over a sibling by the court of law be eligible as a parent? Um, that's a great question. And yes, if, if uh, an out of school youth, so you got somebody that's, let's say anywhere from 24 down to 18 has been assigned guardianship of his or her um, siblings. Yes, they could be a parent or guardian. Yeah, I don't see why not. You just want to have your documentation in line. And it looks like this is our, well, we've got a couple more questions here. Uh, if a local area has a policy that has identified youth local barriers, uh, just confirming the same policy covers out of school youth requiring additional assistance to enter or complete a training program or secure employment. Yep. The way the, the policy hopefully is written, it covers both in school, out of school, they wouldn't have a separate one. So it'd be all how it's worded. So most local areas, they would have used the same uh, criteria for their youth being assistance for the both the in school and out of school. So um, how a monitor is going to look at it is they're going to ask to see the local policy if you've identified this barrier for either in school or out of school, and they're going to look at the local policy. And so I encourage you to look how your local policy is written, but most that I'm familiar with, it usually uses the same criteria for both in school and out of school. And then we have, can a youth be BSD if the math test not required for training program? Um, no, because a youth, you can't even use those not required for training programs. For a youth, the WIOA legislation requires that a youth have a complete assessment prior to even enrollment in a WIOA program, where the math test not required for a training program can only be for an adult or dislocated worker who has the assessment afterwards. So you wouldn't be able to assess a youth as not needing that program because you haven't done the full range of assessments. So a youth, all youth, unless they have a reason to waive the math uh, and reading test based on either the, the placement test or the college degree. So, um, so you can't waive it with that math not required for the training program for a youth. At the moment, that is uh, all the questions. Those are excellent questions. I really like those. So, oh, got one uh, more. Get, just came yep. in. Uh, does someone with a high school diploma need to be marked as a family of one due to disability if disability is used and sole barrier? 
Um, this would come into play if you're trying to make the individual low income. That's the only reason why that family characteristics comes into play is for low income. So uh, if you have a youth that you're having a disability, and let's say it's an out-of-school youth, they're not required to meet low income. So you wouldn't have to say yes to family of one due to disability. But as I'd encouraged you, that if your, your out-of-school youth meets low-income guidelines, meaning he, he or she has a disability, and their own uh, income is below the threshold of a family size of one, which is 12760 I think, or something like around that, um, I would encourage you to record it just so you get credit for being, being low-income also for federal reporting, as well as your negotiations for uh, regression analysis, but it's not required. So the only time that family characteristics of family of one due to disability is required is if you're going to do the low income and the client meets the disability criteria. And that answers all the questions. Awesome. Well, it looks like it takes us right up to about our time, about five minutes to spare. So I appreciate everybody's time. And now the next presentation is going to be on uh, Thursday, excuse me, Wednesday the 16th at 9 o'clock, and it's going to be on wheel a dislocated worker, and then I'm also putting together a new block on follow-up, and I'm going to be referenced the follow-up policies that Commerce recently put out in July, I think it was July and August they they came out, uh, or maybe it was June, but I'll be referencing those, and we're going to cover all the instances where a client is required, federally mandated, as well as our state policy requirements about follow-up, and kind of go in depth about those a little bit also. So it should be a good new block. So again, dislocated worker, as well as uh, mandatory required follow-up is going to be the presentations on Wednesday, the, the 16th, starting at 9 o'clock. Thanks a lot, and have a great day.